All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, as you heard, my name is Brent Vatney. I'm a core contributor to React Native. Uh, I work with a company called Exponent as of quite recently. Uh, what we're doing is building a platform on top of React Native. So you might be able to tell I'm, I really like React Native. Like, I like it a lot. But um, yeah, that's, that's enough about me. Let's talk a bit about React. So this is Tom Aquino. Uh, he's a manager at Facebook. Uh, in this photo, he's announcing React Native at Hmm, lots of feedback. All right, there we go. Okay, in this photo, he's announcing React Native at ReactConf uh, back in January. Um, so one of the more popular pull quotes from his announcement was, the same set of engineers should be able to build applications for whatever platform they choose without needing to learn a fundamentally different set of technologies for each. Uh, we call this approach learn once, write anywhere. Uh, so a really important uh, takeaway from that is without needing to learn a fundamentally different set of technologies. So there will still be some technologies that you'll need to learn. Uh, without React Native, uh, Skillshare between web, iOS, and Android looks something like this. Really, the, the only common ground, I mean, obviously exaggerating, is, is that you're using a keyboard and hopefully not a mouse. Um, with React Native, it's something more like this. Uh, so you're able to leverage your knowledge of React Core, uh, JavaScript, CSS, Flux, um, and other related tools like that on both iOS and Android. So what I'll be talking about today are the concepts that you'll need to learn uh, when you're getting into native mobile development. And I'll specifically focus on how they're handled by React Native. I won't really talk about React Core, React DOM at all, um, but there are a lot of videos. So you know, even if you don't know that so well, hopefully you'll be entertained. Uh, so I think that there are three key differences between uh, mobile and web. Um, so first one, users have higher expectations. So mobile apps just feel a lot better than web apps. Um, users really expect your mobile app to follow with that same sort of standard. Um, second, uh, there are a lot more constraints. So the devices that you're dealing with on mobile are seriously underpowered compared to your 2015 MacBook Pro. Um, so for, to put an actual number to that, the iPhone 6S is the first iPhone that has more than one gigabyte of RAM. And I don't think you can probably remember your last computer that had a gigabyte of RAM. So, uh, and third, the developer has a lot more APIs. So you get push notifications, geofencing, a bunch of built-in UI components, and uh, a lot more like that. So the first topic is higher expectations. And we'll start there with animations. So on the web, animations are kind of mostly seen as unnecessary. I guess there are three main types of animations on the web. There's cat animations. Uh, there's dog. Oh, that's not, there we go. Dog animations. And this one is quite recent, but also Drake animations. Um, <laughs> whereas uh, on mobile, uh, animations are really everywhere, right? So. Cat, dog, and drake animations are all examples of static animations. And this is what you typically see when you work on the web. Uh, you have some view values that are animated from a start to an end value over a fixed period of time. So in the video here, we tap on the hamburger icon, and it animates the menu in. And then we tap it again, it animates the menu out. And so that's a static animation. It's also known as fire and forget. Um, the other type of animations that you'll see a lot on mobile are dynamic animations. Uh, so you don't really see this a lot on the, on the web, really. Um, so they're not really even just animations. They're, they're more like behaviors. So what I mean by that is these animations will happen gradually in response to some type of input stream. So for example, here, we touch on the bottom bar and we start moving our finger upwards. The position of that bar is going to track the movement of our finger. Um, yeah, so keep this particular animation in mind because we're going to look at how to implement that shortly. And lastly, there are physics animations. So physics animations make your interactions feel more lifelike by modeling the uh, actual behavior after real world physics. Um, most physics animations that you'll see are based off of springs. Um, so you can adjust the tension, friction, uh, velocity, and various uh, other factors depending on how you want to configure it to um, make it behave how you need. Um, so the, the library called Animated was created specifically for React Native. And it's the most important API with React Native for doing these types of animations. Um, 
Animated is the name. It's a bit of a weird name, but um, yeah. Uh, so it uses data binding, uh, and it directly manipulates the underlying views um, in order to avoid re-rendering the whole component subtree on each frame. Uh, Christopher Shido did a really good talk about this at React Rally, where he talks about the design decisions behind it. So I will check that out. Um, but here, what we're going to talk about is a little bit on how to use it. So the first thing we need to do here is I'm creating an animated value and just initializing it to zero, and I'm storing that in this state. Uh, next, I create an animated view, which is a special type of view. It knows how to bind uh, the animated style properties to the view. Um, so I'm going to animate the value that I've created from zero to one. So knowing that, I can just set the opacity to um, the animated value directly, because that's the valid range for opacity. Um, whereas for uh, rotation, I'm going to have to interpolate that. So when, uh, when the animated value is zero, the, the rotation should be negative 180 degrees. And when it is one, it should be zero degrees. And so what this interpolation will do is it will determine what the value should be in between those values, and it will just take care of that for us. Um, so you might be familiar with this a bit if you've used D3. I know there's some talks about D3, so probably there's a decent amount of understanding there. It's uh, inspired by that and a very similar idea. So the last thing we need to do is actually perform an animation on the value. So we start a spring, we give it the animated value that we want to animate, and we tell it to go to the value of one, and then we just start the animation. So what we end up with is, is this. So it just rotates and the opacity uh, goes from zero to one. Okay, uh, now we're gonna look at how to create a dynamic animation. So this is what I was referring to when I was saying the keep an eye out for the, um, uh, the RDO animation sliding up the bar from the bottom. Uh, that's what we're gonna look at doing here. So in order to be able to track the touch position, uh, we need to use this thing called the pan responder. Um, so the first thing we're going to do here is we're going to create another animated value, and I've just initialized that to what we want the default value to be for the position of the, the bar. Um, it doesn't really matter. I just gave it a constant value of bottom. Um, next thing we do is we create a pan responder. So the pan responder uh, is initialized with a set of callbacks that you later attach to a view in order to tell it how it should respond to certain touch events. Uh, the first one that we set uh, on move should set pan responder. Uh, what it does is if it returns true, the view that it's attached to will become the responder for that touch. Uh, and so here we're not passing in any arguments to it. It will take the same arguments as the other callbacks that you'll see shortly. Uh, but we're just saying if you touch this view, then this view should become the responder for that touch. Um, and so let me explain for a second what, what some of these terms mean. So responder is, is kind of a fancy name for the view that will receive subsequent touch events for a touch. And there can only be one responder at any given time. And a touch starts when your finger contacts the screen, and it ends when you lift your finger. So the next thing that we're going to implement is uh, what happens when you move your finger. So at this point, we've gone through the on move should set pan responder. We've said, yes, this view is the responder. Um, and now what we're saying is when you are responder and you're moving your finger, we should take your delta y value and then update the animated value to have that delta y value. And lastly, we tell it what to do when we release the touch. So here we're just checking if it is past some certain threshold. And if it's past that threshold, then we will animate it to the top of the screen. Otherwise, we'll just put it back at the bottom. So just to summarize really quickly, uh, first we tell the view that it should become the responder when it's touched. Uh, we tell it to set the drag value to the gestures dy on each move. Um, and then lastly, when we release the responder, um, we animate it to either the top or the bottom of the screen. So this is what that looks like. Um, when it's moving up from the bottom, this is with my finger on the screen. Um, and when I'm past one third of the height of the screen, it will animate to the top. And otherwise, it'll just uh, go right back down to the bottom. You'll notice also there's a, a link to RN Play, which is uh, React Native Playground, as uh, Joshua was talking about earlier. So um, you can have a look at these afterwards and play with them if you like. 
Okay, next up on the list for higher expectations that users have of mobile uh, is navigation transitions. So on the desktop web, it usually looks something like this. Uh, you'll click somewhere, uh, there'll be a flash, maybe whatever the background color is, and then the next page will flash in once that's done loading. Um, so this is great because it lets you throw away your entire app state on, on each uh, change of the page. You don't have to worry about memory leaks nearly as much and things like that, but um, you don't really have that luxury on mobile. So um, on mobile, you're expected to have these long-running apps where you have pleasant transitions between each of the scenes. Um, you should also provide gestures that allow you to swipe back or if you slide it in from the bottom to swipe from the top to the bottom to dismiss the view. Um, and this kind of thing is just pretty uncommon on, on, on the web. Um, what I've done often, if I have something like a single page app, usually that'll even be a sub app within a larger app. And so um, if you look at a site like Facebook, they'll have certain sections where there'll be like a single page app type thing. But overall, if you switch between the main sections on the site, you get to throw away a lot of the context and forget about having pleasant transitions. But you, you never get such a luxury on, on mobile. Um, thankfully, React Native gives you uh, some pretty good tools to deal with this. So um, the Navigator is probably the one that you want to use. Uh, the Navigator API is oriented around two concepts. So there's, there are routes uh, and there are scenes. Um, so routes can be any JavaScript value of your choice. Um, scenes are any React component of your choice. So your job with the Navigator is to provide a render scene function that takes a route and the Navigator object, and you have to return from that a scene component. So what I'm doing here is I'm just providing a really simple view. You would probably have something like home screen returned if the route.id is home or something like that. Um, but here I'm just returning the same scene and putting some text inside of there depending on the uh, text property passed in in the route. Another thing I'm doing is on press on the text, I'm passing that off to the on press callback. And so if we go there, we see that we're going to increment the count and then push a new uh, count to the uh, navigator. So that's a new route that we're pushing in there. As I said, routes can be any arbitrary object. What we've chosen to use here is just an object with a text key and a color key. Um, and so we're just passing in this new route that has these two properties so that we can render that with our render scene. So this is what it looks like. Um, and now we have a way that we can manage our scenes. So you can notice there that when you swipe back, it will dismiss the route and bring you to the previous scene. And when you tap on the text, it will push the, the new scene on. Of course, at some point, you want to be able to customize the transitions that you have. Uh, it's not always ideal to just uh, push it in from the right. And so the Navigator gives you various built-in scene configurations. So you can use uh, float from bottom or float from left, for example. Um, so here I've just made it switch between the two. Uh, you can also provide a custom scene configuration. And uh, in order to figure out how to do that, I'd recommend just looking at the source for scene config. It's pretty much just a plain JavaScript object. So uh, it's not too difficult to work with. So then what we end up here is uh, a navigator where it's alternating between uh, sliding from the bottom and in from the left. And the appropriate gestures um, that match those animations will be provided automatically. Another really important uh, piece of the navigator is the nav bar. So the nav bar, you, you, if you use iOS, you might be familiar with when you swipe back between different scenes, the text will fade in gradually and fade out depending on um, which view is becoming active or inactive. Uh, so what the built-in navigation bar does for you is it implements this behavior in pure JavaScript. Um, so here what we're doing is we just provide a navigation bar prop, which returns um, a navigation bar. And on the navigation bar, we're setting a route mapper. Um, I know this is a lot of information. Don't worry about it. The slides will be available. Uh, <laughs> the, the route mapper has three properties. So it's just an object that has a title, a right button, and a left button. I'm pretty sure it's, it's clear what those are. Um, so for an example, let's look at the title. Uh, the title function will take a route. So that's what we defined before. It'd be like text and color. Um, and based off of that, we can just return any 
React component that will uh, be used as the title. So here I'm just returning the route text that we uh, increment on every tap. So then what we end up with is something like this. Um, it'll animate in, and then as we swipe back, it's going to fade out how you expect. Cool. Um, so that's, that's nice, but I, I mean, there's this big issue with when you have these long-running apps that you need to ensure consistency across your scenes. So the example you see here, um, I'm navigating to somebody's profile from the feed, and I'm liking one of their posts, and then I'm swiping back to the feed. And you'll notice that the post appears as liked, even though I liked it from their profile and not the feed. Um, so this is something where React Native doesn't really give you anything to do this. Um, Right? There, there's nothing specifically built in that, that enables that. Uh, what it does do is that with the navigator, all of your routes that have been mounted and are, are a part of the route stack remain in memory. So if they're tied to some store, they will receive any uh, update events and they can update themselves appropriately. Um, so in order to do that without totally killing the performance of your app, you'll probably need a way to efficiently determine what you need to update. But of course, you'll need a centralized data store of some kind, because if you just have component local state, you won't be able to propagate it through all of the scenes in your app. Uh, so I like to use Redux for state management, as I imagine a lot of you do as well, um, and then Immutable JS as the basis for Redux reducers. So every time any data changes, Redux will try to re-render all of the views, and Immutable makes it possible to uh, just make that efficient by doing a reference equality check. OK, another area where um, there are higher expectations is, of course, around uh, speed and performance. So you should give everyone instant feedback to any interaction they do with the app. Um, so it should be within 100 milliseconds is basically what that means. Additionally, um, the feedback, anytime you tap on something, it should do something like fade the uh, view that you're tapping out gradually. Uh, it should highlight the background on it or do something like the material design ripple effect uh, that you see on Android. Uh, just some sort of way to indicate that they've interacted with the device. Otherwise, it doesn't, feel, uh, it doesn't quite feel right. Another thing is uh, smooth gestures. So if you're dragging a photo around, it would be pretty unpleasant if the app froze and the photo uh, for let's say a second, stop tracking the movement of your finger. Um, so by smooth, I mean it should be as close as possible to 60 frames per second. Um, and if you are going to drop frames, then you'll probably at least want to do it consistently and in the smallest possible batches. So what I mean by that is you don't want to suddenly drop 10 frames, but maybe drop two frames and then render a frame and then two frames and et cetera, that type of thing. So I put a lot of information into the performance guide in the React Native docs, uh, so you can check that out. Uh, it's just the start. There's a lot more to be done around that, but um, it'll get you a lot of the way that you need to go. OK, another key area for performance um, is lists. So user interfaces are pretty much made up of forms for entering data. Then you get lists of the data that's been entered. And then you have specific detail views for the data. Um, but lists, as you can see, they're, like, they're a key component of, of that, uh, of any UI. And so on the desktop, what happens is you can render large lists pretty much without being concerned about it. I mean, you'll probably want to paginate so that you won't have to make huge network requests, but you're not really thinking about how many views you're going to have on the screen in your Facebook newsfeed or how many views you're going to have in the DOM. That's something that just uh, isn't really that big of a concern. Um, so. That's not really the case on mobile. Um, in order for the views to load quickly and smooth, uh, scroll smoothly on a device, there are a few optimizations that are done uh, natively. Um, so usually this is through something like on iOS, a UI collection view or UI table view, um, or similar constructs on Android. Uh, so with React Native, you're given something called the list view. Uh, so this is kind of uh, a weak area of React Native, admittedly. It's, it's a bit of a work in progress at the moment. Um, it's not as robust as the native version, but it, it does work quite well in most cases. It just falls apart a bit when there are very, very long lists. Um, but you, you'll really be surprised by how often you use something like a list view on, on mobile. 
So I'll show you quickly how it works. Uh, so to use the list view, we need to store all of our data inside of a data source. Uh, the data source requires that you provide a row has changed function. Uh, so you can tell the, the list view how to determine um, how a row has changed and whether it needs to be updated. Um, next, we just render out the list view and provide that data source as a prop in the list view. Um, an important thing here is that we are passing in um, render row as a function. So by defining it as a function, um, as a function of the row data, uh, what we're able to do is provide some optimizations around rendering that we'll see very shortly. So what this example that we've done here does is very simple. It just gives us this list with two items that's wrapped in a scroll view. So you can just move it around and you get the bouncy scroll effect on iOS. Um, not too fancy. So these are the, the performance tuning properties. Um, there's initial list size, page size, and scroll render ahead distance. So initial list size defaults to 10, and it tells the list view how many rolls, uh, rows to render synchronously uh, when it's first mounted. Page size tells the list view how many rows to render in each subsequent frame after being mounted. And scroll render ahead distance uh, tells the list view how far ahead in points to render um, by using the page size. Uh, so in this case, what we're doing is when the list view mounts, we render 10 rows. Then on each subsequent frame, we'll render one row until we've rendered up to 2,000 points ahead of the uh, scroll position. These are a few other properties that are really important with list views. Um, in particular, I like the render section header property. And so what that gives you is something like this. You get your sticky section headers that you'll see everywhere on mobile. Um, this just ships with React Native, and it's not a whole lot of work to implement. And uh, you'll definitely be using that with, with list views. Um, so there's another optimization with list views that it's pretty important. It's called remove clip subviews. So this is an optional property on list views. Um, and it can really help with the performance on, on long lists. So what it does is it removes the views that are not visible on the screen uh, from the underlying native view hierarchy. So the views actually stay in memory, um, and they're just remounted when they come back on the screen. So that might sound like there really aren't a lot of benefits to it, but a result of it being unmounted from the uh, native view hierarchy is that now the images can be unloaded from memory. And so that ends up being very important if you have a long list of, uh, let's say, photos on Instagram. Uh, you'll want to be able to unmount the, uh, the views so that you can unload the images and not run into out of memory errors. Another very important tool for performance optimization right now and to maintain 60 frames per second is uh, the interaction manager. So what this does is it lets you defer any CPU intensive work until some sort of uh, gesture interaction or animation has completed. Because when, like I was saying before with the image gallery, if you start dragging a photo around, um, you don't want to be doing uh, any intensive work that will cause you to drop frames during that time. So you'll want to uh, defer that work until uh, the interaction manager no longer has anyone registered um, as an interaction. So let's just set up some scaffolding here. I have some state called is ready. Um, when we're ready, we'll just render this whole scene. Uh, until it's ready, we'll just render a loading screen. And then in component did mount, we call on the interaction manager and we tell it to run a block after interactions. And in that block, we just tell it to say uh, that it's ready to render. So this is really important because right now, um, animations run on the JavaScript thread. Um, so when you render a new scene and we're pushing in the scene from the right by default, um, if your new scene needs to render however many hundred subcomponents, something like that, um, it's pretty likely that that's going to take more than 16 milliseconds to do the reconciliation for that. Uh, so you can probably render some kind of loading scene that you can do easily within that uh, frame deadline, but you want to defer the actual full scene until that animation is completed, otherwise you'll end up with a really janky kind of uh, transition. Okay, and one, one last optimization here is uh, rast rasterization. Uh, some of you might be familiar with this already. Uh, so what it is is uh, it helps you with the problem of overdraw. 
So overdraw occurs when you're making the GPU repaint the same pixel multiple times. Um, so this can negatively affect performance, as you might, you might guess. Uh, so this is useful when you're animating a view with a lot of layers or scrolling through a view uh, that has subviews with many layers. So what I mean by that is you look at this cat, this is just one image, and then we have to paint the star on top, and then we have to paint this one, and this one, and this one, and then the cute text, and then this overlay again. So th there's a lot of repainting being done here, and what we need to do in order for this to likely be performant when we're scrolling in a list of, of these types of views is just enable a couple of properties. So there's should rasterize iOS is the iOS version of this, um, and then there's render to hardware texture Android. So what this does is it's the equivalent of, in Photoshop, doing something like flatten layers. It just pushes them all into one texture and keeps that uh, in memory and then draws from that in the future. Um, so that said, definitely read more about this when you're going to use it because it's possible to shoot yourself in the foot pretty easily because um, it does use more memory. And if you're animating some of the inner views, the inner layers, it's probably not a good idea to use it. But all right. Um, so now how do we monitor our performance? So it's a good idea when you're doing development and come into any performance problems is not to just assume, oh, I think this part of the application is slow. Obviously, I'm sure you all know this. Um, so what you should do is try to track down what the bottleneck is and then try and fix that specifically. Uh, so I find that with React Native, usually the JavaScript thread is holding things up. Um, what you can do is you can turn on the FPS monitor um, and do this on your device and see in the, the parts of the app that feel slow, where are you dropping frames? Um, and then you can do further analysis from there. So I said on your device. It's really important that you run it on your device and not in the simulator. Uh, it's, you know, it's a completely different environment and it will not be representative of the actual performance if you run it in the simulator. Um, so if, if you're having a hard time even with the FPS monitor, and looking through your code based off of just intuition after that, uh, what you might want to do is use, um, aside from whatever profiling to tools you are already familiar with, like React Perf, you might want to use um, the built-in React Native profiler. So you just enable that at some point, and then go through your interaction, and then turn it off, and then uh, it loads up this uh, trace view where you can look at the three most important threads in React Native. So there's the main thread, the JavaScript thread, and the shadow thread, which does layout. And you can trace the flow of events through each and see uh, where the, the bottleneck is happening. Um, so on the web, nobody really expects you to uh, cater to whether they're using Windows or using Mac or Linux. Right? You just have this kind of like web UI. Uh, but that's not really the case on mobile, where there are uh, platform-specific patterns that you need to take into account. And there are good reasons for this as well. So if you look at the um, Android version here of uh, Facebook Ads Manager, um, you'll see that we have uh, no tab bar on the bottom, but instead we have the built-in Android back button and home screen and, and whatnot. Uh, so the results of Android using a back button on the bottom of the screen is that it's not very common to have tab bars because then you have two rows of buttons on the bottom, um, which, I mean, you can easily press the wrong button and, and do all sorts of things like that. So instead, uh, on Android, you'll probably use a what's called a drawer layout, which is sort of a side menu that you swipe up from the side. Um, you know, there's a floating action button there. There's, there's just a few differences you need to take into account on that. Um, so Martin's going to show more about um, these platform differences in his talk next, so I won't talk too much about that. Another issue is with pixel densities. So on the web, you can kind of just do whatever you probably, um, uh, how many people have 1x, 2x, 3x assets for everything on the web? You put your hand up. Yeah, right, that's, that's what I thought. Uh, nobody does. Like if you go to facebook.com and look at the, the tab bar in the top, they don't even have 2x assets. So, oh, oops. <laughs> Uh, but on, the, on mobile, you can't really get away with that. Uh, you have to provide various sizes for it because otherwise it's just not going to look good, right? There's this expectation people have that this is a retina device, you're going to have retina assets on this device. Um, 
So React Native gives you a few good tools for that. Uh, so you can access the pixel ratio directly if you want to do something programmatically with your layout based off of the pixel ratio. Or the image component itself will automatically determine which image to use. Um, so here with reactive.png, if we did reactive at 1x, reactive at 2x, reactive at 3x, it would just pick the correct one for us depending on the uh, device's pixel ratio. OK. So that was everything about higher expectations. Um, the next topic is the constraints. So like I was mentioning before with long running apps, uh, you can't just throw the context away with every, every request. Um, memory is a really valuable resource on, on mobile devices. So you need to make sure you clean up after yourself. Um, memory leaks will really add up over time. Uh, where, whereas on the web, you get to throw away your memory leaks and if you navigate to a new page, on, on mobile, if you're using React Native um, and really just mobile in general, these memory leaks can, can definitely add up as you're going between different scenes. Um, on iOS, your app can be killed during multitasking if, uh, if it's holding too much memory. So maybe you've seen that where you're in your app, you minimize it, go to another app, and then come back and notice that this app is, looks like it's being restarted. So that happened because it was holding too much memory. Um, so it, it, there's also an important factor that um, mobile apps tend to focus a lot on media. So there's a lot of image and video. Um, and so the remove clip subview prop that I mentioned before is really important for reducing uh, memory usage. Another important constraint is with connectivity. So you'll have to deal with uh, users who have no connection at all. Like for example, I am currently in Slovakia where I have no data. So when I open up an app, um, I wouldn't expect it to just close or say go away until you get data or something like that, right? I should be able to view some offline cache data and maybe write a message, write a message and then have that automatically be sent out uh, when I come into an area with data. Um, similarly, you might just have a slow connection. Um, maybe you're on the train in a tunnel or something like that. Um, so you should definitely build in timeouts and retries into your app. Um, and that's something, probably a lot of you do that already for the web, but I don't suspect you do it everywhere. Uh, but it's, it's definitely worth doing in your mobile app because requests will time out. And if your app gets into a weird inconsistent state when it times out, uh, it's not gonna be a very pleasant experience. So there's a component called NetInfo that lets you pick out the current state of the network. Uh, if you don't have a connection, it will let you know that this is connected uh, Boolean that's passed in. And that's pretty much all there is to that. You just add a listener to it and do whatever you need. Um, so maybe you just show a banner or something. Um, in terms of handling timeouts, um, you can use something very simple like this where it's just a, a function that wraps a promise and if this doesn't complete in a certain number of milliseconds, then the promise is rejected and we clear the timeout. Um, so if we use this in conjunction with async await, uh, then it, it's actually quite clear. We just do try and then we um, await the response of the HTTP request. So here we'll, we'll give it 10 seconds to complete. If it doesn't complete, we can catch that and maybe set the state for this scene to say, hey, we couldn't get the data, click here to retry. So it's not that hard to do. So battery usage is another issue that I'm almost certain nobody has thought about on the web. And that's fair. You probably don't really need to. I mean, Chrome already uses huge amounts of battery. I don't think your app's going to make it that much worse. Um, but on mobile, it's definitely a consideration, especially with things like geolocation. Like, how frequently do you need to be polling for their location? You probably want to minimize that to the least amount that you actually need in order to not kill their battery. Um, and you know, there, are, there are all sorts of other things like that. Network, network requests, try to avoid making unnecessary network requests. Otherwise, uh, that'll also consume quite a bit of battery. Um, so don't just pull the server for updates constantly. Maybe set up a WebSocket. Um, so that, there, there are tools that are provided um, on each platform. With iOS, with Xcode, you can monitor your battery usage uh, just by going to the energy impact section. And if you just keep an eye on that and make sure you're not kind of getting out of control, uh, that will probably be sufficient a lot of the time. So this constraint, uh, the new mode of interaction, is 
I think fairly obvious. You, you no longer have an external keyboard on mobile. You have touch. Everything that you do to interact with the device, with the exception of a couple of things like shake and the accelerometer, um, everything is touch and just some combination of how you touch the screen to create a certain gesture. So you get tap, double tap, long press, 3D touch um, with varying degrees of pressure. You get swipe, uh, pinch to zoom, etc. Um, and then there are actually a lot of accessibility gestures built on top of that. So there's something called magic tap where you do two taps, uh, two double taps in the, the middle of the screen and that will perform like the main action and uh, that's, that's meant for that screen and that's meant for visually impaired users. So luckily the, the layout system itself, as many of you may know already, is consistent across platforms with React Native. Uh, you get Flexbox. Um, but there are still some concerns that just don't exist on, uh, on the web. So the keyboard, the keyboard's a big one. Um, in fact, I think that's the, the biggest uh, thing to consider when you're doing mobile development in terms of how the OS can interact with your layout. So when the keyboard opens, you might have to scroll somewhere on the screen in order to um, accommodate the view so they can actually see what they are interacting with. Um, do they have something like predictive typing enabled because then the keyboard size will be slightly different? Uh, what is the height of their device? If they're using an iPhone 4 versus a 6 Plus or 6S Plus, uh, you're going to have a very different viewport size with the keyboard open. Uh, so those are definitely considerations that are, that are pretty important. Um, there's orientation. So if you look at some of the top, like most popular apps on the App Store like uh, Facebook or Twitter, uh, they don't really support orientation changes with the exception of things like image galleries. Um, but generally speaking, you can kind of just lock your orientation to whatever it's meant for and then on a case-by-case -case basis enable it. And then the last one is status bar, which is actually surprisingly difficult to get right. Um, you may have even seen on your own bugs with built-in Apple apps like Apple Music will sometimes in response to the status bar height changing. Um, render the tab bar with a space underneath it equivalent to the size of the status bar. Um, so there, there are a lot of things to, to really consider with, with the layout that, that don't exist on, on the web. Um, so this is what it looks like if you don't take these kind of things into account. So here we're tapping on this email field and we're um, trying to fill out the form to sign up, which is, I mean, I imagine you want people to sign up. You want to reduce the friction to signing up. But what happens is I click on that and suddenly I'm, I'm seeing this whole area above still which is totally useless to me at the point of me deciding to sign up. What it should do is shift up and show me the form, as much of the form as possible. Um, but actually what happens is it covers up the whole form except for the username. Um, and if this was a smaller device, if this was an iPhone 4, I wouldn't even be able to see the username. Um, and even when I press next here, it doesn't jump to the next field. So this is actually a constraint with, with React Native at the moment. Uh, React Native does not implement a tab index. So if you are going to jump from one text field to another when you submit it, then you have to manually focus the next field. Um, so if anyone wants to work on that, that would be great. <laughs> uh, so here's how you can um, handle these situations with React Native. Uh, there's the device event emitter, which you can add a listener to for various events. Uh, so for the keyboard, it's keyboard will show. There's a few others as, as well, like keyboard did show, which is after that's already completed. Um, and so the handler that you provide for that is given an object that has end coordinates, duration, easing, a couple of other properties that uh, are not so important. And then what you can do in response to that is set the state or somehow update your layout so that it fits appropriately to um, accommodate the keyboard. Additionally, there's status bar frame will change. So this just get, gets the height of the status bar. So if you have a phone call or you're watching someone's geolocation, you'll actually be doubling the size of the status bar. So you can take that into account as well. And in addition to that, with the status bar, you can style it by sending it to light or dark. Um, if you have a dark status bar on a dark background, that's not going to look very good. So you need to consider that and switch it so that you can actually see the status bar. Or maybe you just decide that you don't need the status bar at all, in which case you can hide it. And lastly, with uh, orientation, you similarly just um, add a listener to an orientation event and uh, respond to that as necessary. 
All right, development workflow is probably the, the main area where people uh, recognize a difference between mobile and web because with native development, you're stuck using IDEs like Xcode or Android Studio and every time you make a change, you compile your project and then you navigate to the screen and make sure that the view has moved over one point to the right or that it's that new shade of red or, or whatever. Um, it's a little bit different with React Native. Um, so you, you get a lot of the stuff that you're familiar with. You can use a Chrome debugger and actually just throw in a debugger statement at any point and inspect the state of your application. Um, you can even use an element inspector uh, to click on things and see the various style properties. And you can change those by using uh, React Dev Tools. Um, so React Native also supports live reload, as you saw from Joshua's presentation earlier. Um, but actually, Dan Abramov is joining Facebook, so I'm really hoping that he'll work on uh, live reloading for React Native, because he's actually joining the React Native tooling team, so I'm optimistic. Um, in terms of sharing your app, that's another area where the development workflow is uh, very different. So if you're gonna share your app on the web and you have some local server, you might just open up an ngrok server and send someone the URL. Um, so if you're gonna do this natively, you probably have to either send them the repo and have them build it, or deploy the app to the App Store, or put it on something like uh, Test Flight. Uh, and Test Flight can take hours. It can actually take three, four, five hours, depending on how slow uh, it is that day. I mean, ideally it doesn't take that long, but it definitely can. Um, with React Native, uh, you could definitely do the same th sort of thing, but you could use something like React Native Playground, alternatively, to share some code. Uh, or if you use Exponent, um, you can have your friend or coworker, uh, just download the Exponent app from the App Store, and you can do the same sort of thing as you do on the web and just share uh, this ngrok URL to access your app. Um, when you're done, you can just hit publish, and then anyone can access that app with the Exponent app at any given time. And when you're finally ready to deploy the app, um, so as I said, with, with Exponent, you just press publish, and that's great. It doesn't actually publish to the App Store, though. Um, so if you want to deploy the app to the App Store, you have to wait an average of seven days for it to be approved. Um, and that, that's a pretty long time. Because uh, on the web, what you typically get is on every request, you have a chance to send them a new version of the app. Right? Um, zero downtime deploys are pretty common, and it's just not something that you can do with native mobile apps. Um, but again, that's an area where I think React Native has a bit of an advantage because you can use tools like App Hub, which allow you to send uh, app updates over the air. So I know there was a bit of concern about that earlier, but really the, the terms of service indicate, and they were updated recently, to say that you can run uh, code from JavaScript core uh, inside, of, uh, inside of your app and download it as well. Um, Uh, so to add AppHub, uh, all you need to do is uh, basically install the SDK and then you drop this little bit of code into your, uh, into your app delegate and it will just uh, get the most recent version of your app every time you start it and update in the background as well. Um, so when you publish a new version of the app, you upload your IPA to the uh, AppHub um, dashboard and then you just hit publish and that will be sent out to everyone who has uh, your app from the App Store already. Another alternative to AppHub, though, is something called Code Push. So Code Push does the same thing, um, but instead of having a dashboard, it's all controlled through the CLI. Uh, so this was actually recently open sourced by Microsoft. Uh, they're using it for Cord Cordova projects internally, but they've also built out a React Native SDK. Uh, acceptance testing is, is a big thing and continuous integration with, with native app development because if you want to test your iOS app and you want to test it end to end, you're going to need to run it on a Mac. Uh, CircleCI supports that and so does Travis, but there are some issues with it being a bit flaky. Uh, so what you can do alternatively is buy a rack of Mac minis and just set them up in your office. Um, but one of the great things about writing your app with React Native is that now a lot of your app is just JavaScript, right? So you don't need to test it uh, necessarily entirely um, on, on something like a Mac if that's the platform that you're using. Um, 
Now, a caveat to that is that there aren't really a lot of best practices at the moment in the React Native community for testing components. Um, hopefully that's something that, that emerges soon, but it's still an early project. OK, and a couple of uh, exceptions to these constraints. Um, there are actually some advantages as well. Uh, so imagine if, with your website, you could ship a custom build of Chrome. Um, so it would give you all the power to customize anything that you want at a low level. And this is essentially what you get with mobile apps. Uh, so here's an example from the issues, uh, React Native issues, where um, someone was saying they built a yearly calendar component, and it was made up of over 400 views, and it was taking three to five seconds uh, to render, which is obviously unacceptably slow. Um, someone suggested that you would probably even have that problem if you weren't using React Native, if you were just using UIKit. Suggested maybe trying a lower level primitive uh, core animation layer. So he went ahead and implemented that, and you could see on one side, I'll let you guess which one is which, um, is the unoptimized one, and on the other side is optimized. And so you get quite a, quite a benefit in terms of performance there by just um, dropping down to a lower level. And ultimately, the API that he ended up with exposed to JavaScript looked like this. So just ended up with a React component, and I mean, he had to write some Objective-C for it or Swift, uh, but it's exposed in the end as, as a React component, and you can uh, use it in that way afterwards. Another alternative to doing it this way would have just been to use React Native Arch. So that lets you access these lower level drawing primitives directly as well, um, but doesn't require you to write any additional native code. The other advantage is multi-threading. So in the web browser, JavaScript runs on the main thread, and it can prevent user input uh, from being handled if it blocks. So an another issue there is that images are decoded on the main thread. So if you're scrolling and you're loading an image at the same time, you might feel a little bit of jank on that. Um, whereas on mobile and specifically with React Native, um, Everything, well, several things happen on, on various different threads. And so what you're seeing here actually is I just simulate a very slow action in the, in the browser that takes a few seconds, and I'm trying to scroll at the same time, and it's not working. If I hover over some text, it's not working. And so this is what you'll probably see happen, but at a less exaggerated scale uh, if you do anything complicated in your app. And um, a nice thing with, like I was saying, with React Native is now you have the handling of the user input, um, on the main thread, and then we run the rendering logic and such on the React Native thread, uh, which is the JavaScript thread. And so here, when I press this filter button, it's performing that same, uh, code, that same block of code that I was running in the browser, and so it's blocking the UI briefly, but I can still scroll because that's handled natively on the native thread. Um, the actual alert that shows up uh, doesn't happen until we've yielded uh, to the JavaScript thread. Uh, so a bit of an issue with that is that now uh, all the communication between these threads is asynchronous. So with React Native, if we want to measure the width, height, x, y position, we actually have to make a call to the native side and wait a frame for it to respond. Um, with the DOM, right, it's on the same thread, so you can just grab the offset width directly from there. A nicer way to do that is probably to use async await with React Native. Um, so this transform is enabled by default, and you can definitely use this to clean up a lot of callbacks. All right, last thing, running out of time, is uh, more APIs. So there are a lot of high-quality UI widgets, right? I mean, native, you get a lot of this stuff out there. You don't, there's a reason why there's no bootstrap native, right? Because you don't need it. You get a lot of really nice components just out of the box, um, whether it's like a map or uh, some sort of picker, like a date picker or a calendar, uh, drawer layout, toolbar, tab bar, various types of toasts and alerts, uh, scroll view, view pager, et cetera. And you can actually view all of these by cloning the React Native repo and going to the UI Explorer and running that and just clicking around. Another API to deal with is execution states. So on the web, your app is either open or it's just not open. You don't have it open in the browser. Um, so that's a bit different on mobile, where you can have not running, inactive, active, et cetera. Um, you can run tasks in the background. Uh, you can be launched from a push notification or from a quick action. Uh, there are different ways to transition between these states. And so this is just a whole other set of APIs that you uh, would want to be aware of. Uh, there's OS integration. So are you going to index your app in Spotlight? If you do, 
then how do you respond to uh, being uh, told to open from Spotlight for a certain route? Um, you have to build the whole navigation stack for that specific route and bring the user to that section. Um, you have to actually perform the indexing manually. Um, and there's like widgets on Android and, and that sort of thing. All right. And lastly, uh, there are just a lot of other fun APIs and, and applications that you can do with mobile. Um, just by having this device in your pocket with all these sensors and an internet connection, uh, it opens up a lot of possibilities that you can't really do on, on the desktop or especially you know, on the web. Um, so one of these examples is a friend of mine made a geofencing app that opens his garage door automatically. Um, the Arduino thing, which you saw in the uh, lightning talk and, and various other things. So yeah, mobile is different for these three key reasons, I believe. Um, with React Native, at least you get to use this consistent set of technologies across web, iOS, and Android. Um, but there are still some new things to learn. And I hope I've covered a lot of those new things, even if it was fairly rapid fire. Um, but I encourage you to give React Native a try and go to native.reactjs.com or exponentjs.com or arnplay.org. Whatever you choose, just give it a try, and I think you'll like it. Thank you. Well, nice. I think we have time for one or two questions, and then we have okay. to move on. All right, I can answer the first one. No. Uh, next one. Is the was app easy. <laughs> uh, the conference app. Uh, yes, all of the conference apps are available. If you go to uh, reactnative.cc, which is a newsletter that I run for React Native, I believe in the second most recent issue, I link to all of the conference entries. Um, yeah, so you can get it there. Uh, okay, React Native uh, compares to NativeScript. Uh, so essentially, NativeScript runs uh, synchronously. So as I was showing before with uh, React Native, when you're communicating between the native thread and the JavaScript thread, um, this is all happening through an asynchronous bridge. Um, native script, you're essentially, um, you're writing JavaScript that is the same, it, it calls the exact same functions as in, uh, as in the host platform. Um, so it happens on the same thread, and there are other, yeah, lots of, it's a big topic. <laughs> uh, yeah, we we'll go to the next one. SVG in React Native, uh, I have a library for that that you can use. Um, I haven't really made it so robust, but if you want to submit a pull request and make that work, uh, I mean, it works. If you want to make it better, go for it. Um, similarly, you can use React Native Art, like I mentioned before, which allows you to do a lot of SVG-style drawing, uh, as well as animate those components, however you like. So that's a, yeah. Cool. Is that good? Cool. Thank you so much. Sweet. Thanks.